Hi, this is Morris Rowe with the Virginia News Source. And today we're going to talk to Ben Loyola, one of six candidates for the GOP nomination to the second district of Virginia. Um, ben, what is the purpose of government as far as you're concerned? Well, the, the original purpose of government was uh, for the, provide for the common defense. I mean, America was land of opportunity, wealth, resources, and people came to this country for the ability to bring up their families, work their land, work their businesses, and they formed government really for protection of themselves so they can concentrate on, on, on the pursuit of freedom. Um, so really that's why it's, it's a beautiful thing to read the Constitution and the preamble in that it says to provide for the common defense. So that's really the, the main focus of it and structure to be able to people live their lives. Don't you think the purpose of government has been perverted quite a bit? It definitely has. Uh, you know, the second word, the second part of the yeah. preamble is to promote the general yeah. welfare, and that promote has kind of been flip-flopped, unfortunately, right. and I see that erosion, and that's one of the challenges that we're having today in government. What do you see as the major um, issues in this race um, that you're being told by the people, not what your consultants are telling you? The, the, the economy, as I see it, uh, and the national debt, and they're, they're pretty much tied one the same. Uh, the fact that... Uh, the eroding economy has caused a, a significant uh, double-digit uh, unemployment is a huge factor it's affecting all Americans. Um, the runaway spending by the government, the deficit, these are all factors that are affecting the, the lack of jobs and opportunity. Obama and Congress try to, if they had tried to simplify the Medicare thing and separate the problems out, would that not have been a better way for us to approach what he's calling the number one issue in the country. For example, getting rid of the fraud, waste, and abuse, um, getting digitized uh, medical records. Um. More uh, competition across state lines, giving individuals more choice, uh, tort reform by controlling the runaway uh, liability claims uh, for medical uh, claims, as well as more opportunities for individuals to have choices of policies tailored to their needs just like you would have for auto, automobile insurance, to be able to select and pick. Those are common sense. And then the fraud. Uh, Medicare is 6% fraud across the country. I can't imagine being a store owner and having 6% of your products just walk out the door. In New York City alone, it's 10% fraud. No private enterprise can afford something like that. But here we are with a government, in essence, uh, organized and subsidized program, socialized uh, program, that we have that. And it's well, acceptable because they can print the money. They don't have to account to the bottom line. That's right. Are there any circumstances under which you would support uh, universal health care? Um, we have to make sure that the, the, the true individuals that cannot have health care for themselves, and we have that, that net, that safety net, Medicaid, for those people that truly cannot provide for themselves, cannot provide health care, to make sure that they're taken care of. So the only universal health care I care for would be an opportunity to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to provide health care. But some people just don't even want it. Even in my company with 40 employees, we have young people that elect not to have it. I, you know, we try to tell them, it's like, that's probably not a good idea, but they elect to. It's their money. It's their choice. And, and, right. and, and it's their right. And we don't want and we don't need uh, and we should never have mm -hmm. government force anybody to take on any kind of health care for themselves. Well, another hot uh, topic that I heard you talk about before was the TARP. If you're too big to fail, you're too big to exist. Can you explain what you mean by that? I, you know, America, again, going back to the foundation of what this, what this country became a, a superpower of, is, is individuals, entrepreneurs, working the land, working their mind, their brilliance, the education, and, and creating opportunities, creating a product, providing a service, and, and creating prosperity for themselves, their family, their communities, their cities. And it, it's, it's the... It's the belief that this country is, is a greatness, and it still has that capability to uh, maintain its greatness. So when you go in there and provide and try to assist a certain sector of the economy, I think it, it changes, it adulterates their true free enterprise market. So th that's the problem we have right now with government is trying to middle in there, getting their hands involved, and trying to correct and adjust different sectors. And that's doomed to failure. It's never worked. It never will. So you will let these big companies go on out of business? Well, the, the, the free enterprise capitalism, uh, free enterprise market is, is, is the purity of what we need to have more of versus the government control we have right now. On the back side, though, I do believe that if they're too big to fail, they're too big to exist. And that's one area where when you start to get into the fascist realm where a, a large government, a, a, a large private enterprise becomes so large they dominate the market, in essence a monopoly, 
where they now control the political powers and they're kind of in bed in essence with the political machines. And we have industries that are, that are affected that way and that's very concerning. So really we have to make sure that there's enough competition that they're not so large. Okay. A uh, couple of quick things here. We have so many military bases overseas that if we got rid of half of the, what, there's 300 and some military yeah. bases that, you know, a lot of those guys are just sitting around and uh, eating and standing guard duty. Uh, wouldn't that help the economy dramatically? Because the military, as we know it right now, is spread too thin. Are there bases or are there uh, military programs, are there bases around the globe that we need to look at that we might not need? Um, I don't have the answer for that. We, need to, we could look at each one of them, see what treaties, what relationships, what the history of what that, and look at that and scrutinize that, just like I scrutinize my budget in my company, just like we scrutinize our, our, our checkbooks and our budgets in our households to figure out where we're spending money. However, I don't think that's the number one priority. I believe by helping the economy overall and looking about redirecting the funds that we're expending on programs we truly do not need and they're not constitutional, that's where really the main focus is. Aren't you a little bit Reaganistic in wanting to eliminate the Department of Education? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm very concerned, uh, back to the history of this country, um, looking about where education is local, education is family. Um, I saw where homeschooling, when they have uh, the ability for voucher programs to be able to go to the school of your choice, whether it be a private school, whatever, it's your money, it's your expenses. Uh, I support those programs and when you add another huge layer of government, the Department of Education for example, that just, it's a tax. You send federal tax revenue through the IRS system to the government, they, they process it so that agency takes their chunk and then you go to the Department of Education, that agency takes their chunk and then it eventually comes back down to the local school system you can see the, the huge amount of inefficiency that and the, that the kids are shortchanged. And ultimate change. So will that hurt teachers? Absolutely not. I think a lot more money will be able to stay and, and, sure. and provided for the teachers ultimately if this education is local and that's where it needs to stay. Okay. We're going to be running out of time and we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll run over if you want to. Sure. But the first thing is you said that uh, you were here from Cuba. When did you come from Cuba and uh, how, have you been back? Uh, no. <laughs> um, I was born in 61, uh, November 61, and uh, my, my dad was a Cuban naval officer, and uh, he, after Fidel Castro came out of the mountains promising prosperity for everyone, he uh, stood up against uh, communism and was basically put uh, sentenced to death for that, uh, and he was able to escape in a cargo hold of a ship. Um, his other fellow officers weren't, weren't so unfortunate. Um, and but he came to America. So I left about uh, eight months after that. I was born in 61, so in 60, end of 62, um, and we lived to Madrid, Spain. It's about a year and a half old. Okay, so uh, your dad sees this savior come out of the mountains <laughs> wearing a beard, and he's got other guys hanging around with him. It looked just a, is there any uh, correlation between that and oh hope and change? <laughs> well, um, I, I will say that the messages of, of socialism and, and, and communism uh, or socialized programs when they, when they start changing and throwing the Constitution under the bus, that concerns me. Um, I don't think the par parallels in terms of the, the human rights violation, of course, that uh, uh, Fidel did and uh, all the things that happened with his regime, but uh, we have a, an, an agenda, a progressive agenda, that concerns me and that's kind of one of the, the very reasons I'm running uh, because I believe after serving my country for 30 years in the military, I'm currently a reservist, I'm a captain in the Navy Reserve, that I can serve my country in, in Washington uh, because I have everything to be thankful for for this country, uh, for everything that's provided thanks to my parents, the sacrifice they made, and, and God, and my fortunately I have my ability and my education and my talents to, to apply it. I've done well for myself. Do you have any, um, would you put any limitation on gun rights for uh, lawful abiding citizens? The individual right, the Second Amendment, the, the ability to defend yourself and protect yourself, that is a fundamental right that this country was founded upon. This is not a police state. It should never become a police state. I shuddered when Obama said he wanted a, a civilian defense force larger and more capable than the military. But uh, ultimately, it's up to yourself to defend yourself because the uh, police can't be everywhere. Okay. Well, Ben, that just about wraps it up. Um, if uh, you don't have anything else to add. Well, I, I'd ask, I ask your uh, constituents and your, your listeners, my name is Ben Loyola. I have a great website, benloyola.com. Obviously, I could not capture all the information we captured here in a few moments. Uh, I ask for your vote, I ask for your support, uh, and I ask for your donations. So I look forward to representing the, second, the members of the 2nd Congressional District up in Washington, D.C., and thank you for the time. We thank you, and um, this will be on Virginia News Source. It's a production of Virginia News Source.